Berkshire Hathaway Incorporated. The shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway Incorporated are gaining net return in 2004 was $8.3 billion, which increased the Berkshire book value of both our Class A and Class B stock by 10.5% over the last four years. That is since present management took over. Book value has grown from $19 to $55,824, a rate of 21.9% compounded annually. All figures in this report applied to Berkshire's A shares as successor to the only stock that the company had outstanding before 1996. The B shares of an economic interest equal to 1 30th that of the A. As per share interest value, the accounts are not book value here. The news is good. Between 1996 and 2004, Berkshire morphed from a struggling northern textile business whose intrinsic value is less than book into a diversified enterprise worth far more than book our four year gain in intrinsic and intrinsic value has therefore somewhat exceeded our 21.9% gain in book. For an explanation of intrinsic value and economic principles that guide Charlie Munger, my partner and Berkshire's vice chairman, and me in running Berkshire, please read our owner's manual beginning on page 73. Despite your shortcomings, early calculations of book value are useful at Berkshire as a slightly understated gauge for measuring the long-term rate of increase in our intrinsic value. The calculations are less relevant, however, than they once were in rating any single year's performance versus the S&P 500 index. A comparison we display on the facing page, our equity holdings including convertible preferred have Falling considerably as a percentage of our net worth from an average of 114% in the 1980s, for example, less than 50% in recent years. Therefore, yearly movements in the stock market in the stock market now affect a much smaller portion of our net worth than once was the case. Fact that will normally cause us to underperform in years when stock rise substantially and overperform years when they fall. However, the yearly comparison work out Richard's long term performance versus the SP remains all important. Our shareholders can buy the SP through an index fund at very low cost. Unless we achieve gains in per share intrinsic value in the future, that would do it. S&P Charlie and I will be adding nothing to what you can accomplish on your own. Last year, Berkshire's book value gain of 10.5% fell short of the index 10.9% return. Our lackluster performance was not due to any stumbles by the CEOs of our operating businesses. As always, they pulled me more than their share of the load. My message to them is simple. Run your business if it were the only asset your family will own over the next 100 years. Almost invariably, they do just that. And after taking care of the needs of their business, send excess cash to Omaha for me to deploy. I didn't do that job very well last year. My was to make several multi-billion dollar acquisitions that would add new and significant streams of earnings to the many we already have, but I struck out. Additionally, I found very few attractive securities to buy Berkshire, therefore, and in the year of $43 billion of cash equivalents, not a happy position. Charlie and I will work to translate some of this hard into more interesting assets during 2005, though we can't promise success. In one respect, 2004 was a remarkable year for the stock market. In fact, buried in the same maze, numbers in page 2 of the example of 35 years since the 1960s ended, you will find that investors are including the Vincent from owning the S&P has averaged 112 percent annually. Well, what do you expect for your return returns to be? But if you look for years with returns anywhere close to that, 11.2% says between 8% and 14%. You will first only one before 2004. In other words, last year's normal return is anything but. Over the 35 years, American business had delivered terrific results. It should therefore have been easy for the investors to earn juicy returns. All they had to do was piggyback corporate America in a diversified low expense way, and the fund that they never touched would have done the job. Instead, many investors have had experience in trading from mediocre to disastrous. There have been three primary causes. First, high costs, usually because investors traded excessively to spend far too much on investment management. Second, for value decision based on tips and fads rather than on thoughtful quantified evaluation of business. And a third, a start, a uh, stop approach to the market marked by untimely entries after an advance has been long underway and exits after periods of stagnation or decline. Investors should remember that excitement and expenses are their enemies. If they insist on trying to time their participation in equities, they should try to be fearful and others are greedy, greedy only when others are fearful. Sector results. As managers, Charlie and I want to give our owner's financial information and commentary we would just receive if our roles were reversed. To do this, with both character and reasonable, reasonable brevity, becomes more difficult to break our scope widen. Some of our businesses have vastly different economic characteristics from others, which means that our consolidated statements with their general figures make useful analysis almost impossible. On the following pages, therefore, we will present some balance sheet and earnings figures from our major categories of business, along with commentary about each, but particularly we want to understand the limited circumstances under which we will use depth given that we typically shun it. We will not, however, inundate you with data that has no real value in estimating Breakshire's intrinsic value. Doing so with tend to obfuscate the facts that count regulated utility businesses. We have an 80.5% fully diluted interest in mid-American energy holdings, which owns a wide variety of utility operations. The largest of these are one, Yorkshire Electricity and Northern Electric, whose $3.7 million electric consumers make it the third largest distributor of electricity in the UK. Two, Mid-American Energy, which serves 698,000 electric consu- customers, primarily in Iowa. And three, Kern River Northern Natural Pipelines, which carry 7.9% of the natural gas consumed in the U.S.
The remaining 19.5% of Mid American owned by three partners of ours, Dave Sakal and Rev Abel, the broke manager of these businesses, and Walter Scott, a longtime friend of mine, who introduced me to the company because Mid American is subject to the public utility home of the company act, PUHCA. Berkshire's vol- voting interest is limited to 9.9%. Voting control of the rest of Walter. Our limited voting interest forces us to account for Mid American in an abbreviated manner. Instead of our fully incorporating companies' assets, liabilities, revenues, and expressing the Berkshire statements, we make one line entries only in both our balance sheet and income account. That's likely, though, that P- UHCA will someday, perhaps soon, be repealed or that accounting rules will change. British has consolidated figures would then incorporate all of Mid-America, including substantial debt. It utilizes though this step is now n- not now or nor will ever be obligation of Brickshire. At the year end, $1.478 billion of Mid-Americans junior debt was payable to Brickshire. This debt has allowed acquisitions to be financed without our partners needing to increase. They're already... A substantial investment in Mid-American by changing 11% interest. Berkshire is compensated fairly for putting up the funds needed for purchase while our partners have spread the illusion of their equity interest because Mid-American made no large acquisition last year and paid down $100 million of what it owes us. Mid-American also owns a significant non utility business, Home Services of America, the second largest real estate broker in the country. Unlike our utility operations, this business is highly cyclical, but nevertheless, one we view enthusiastically. We have an exceptional manager, Ron Peltier, who through both his acquisition and operational skills is building a brokerage powerhouse. Home Services is participating in $59.8 billion of transactions in 2004, a gain of $11.2 billion from 2003. About 24% of the increase came from six acquisitions made during the year through our 17 brokerage firms, all of which retained their local identities. We employ more than 18,000 brokers in 18 states. Home service is almost certain to grow substantially in the next decade as we continue to acquire leading localized operations. Last year, Mid-American wrote off a major investment in Zinc Recovery Project that was initiated in 1998 and became operational in 2002. Large quantities of Zinc are present in the brine produced by our California geothermal operations, and we believe we could profitably extract the metal for many months. It appeared that commercially viable recoveries were imminent, but in mining, just as in oil exploration, prospects have a way of teasing their developers, and every time one problem was solved and another popped up in September, we threw in the towel. Our failure here illustrates the importance of a uh, guideline stay with simple proposition that we usually apply in investment as well as operations if only one variable is key to decision and the available is a 90% chance of going your way the chance for a successful outcome is obviously 90% but if 10 independent variables need to break favorably for a successful result and each has 90% probability of success the likelihood of having a winner is only 35% in our zinc venture we solved most of the problems but one proved intractable and that was one too many since your chain is no stronger than its wealthiest link, weakest link it makes sense to look for if it looks cool it's an oxymoron monolink chains a breakdown of Mid American's result follows in 2004. The other category includes a 72.2 million profit from sale of an Enron receivable that was thrown in when we purchased Northern Natural two years earlier. Walter, Walter Dave, and I, as natives, all have viewed this anticipated gain was water's reparations, partial compensation for the loss of our city suffered in 1986 when Ken Lay moved to Northern to Houston after promising to leave the company here. For details, see Berkshire 2002 annual report. Here are some key figures on Mid American's operations. UK Utilities, Iowa Utility, Pipelines, Home Services, other net loss for zinc project, earnings before corporate interest and taxes, interest other than Berkshire, interest in Berkshire Junior Debt, Income Tax, Net Earnings, Earnings Applicable to Berkshire, Debt Owned to Others, Debt Owed to Berkshire, Earnings in Million Dollars, 2004-2003. 326, 268, 288, 130, 172, 579, 605, 212, 170, 53, 170, dollars, 237, dollars, 10,228, 1,478, 2003, 289, dollars, 269, 161, 113, 190, 46, 1,076, 225, 184, 251, 416, 429, 10,296, 1,578. Includes interest earned by Berkshire Net Affiliated Income Taxes of 110. $10 in 2004 and $118 in 2003. Insurance since Berkshire purchased national indemnity and ICO in 1967. Property casualty insurance has been our core business in the propellant of our growth. Insurance has provided a fountain of funds when we have acquired the securities business that now give us an ever winding variety of earnings streams. So, in this section, I will be spending a little time telling you how we got where we are. The source of our insurance fund is float, which is money that doesn't belong to us, but that we temporarily hold. Most of our float arises because one, premiums are paid up front through the service we provide. Insurance protection is delivered over a period that usually covers a year. And two, loss events that occur today do not allow a result in our immediately paying claims because it sometimes takes many years for losses to be reported. Asbestos losses would be an example. Negotiated and settled the $20 million of float that came with our 1967 purchase has now increased both by the way of internal growth and acquisitions to $46.1 billion. 
float is wonderful if it doesn't come at a high price. Its cost is determined by underwriting results, meaning how the expenses and losses will ultimately pay compare with the premiums we have received. When an underwriting profit is achieved, as has been the case at Berkshire in about half of their 38 years we have been in the insurance business, float is better than free. In such years, we are actually paid for holding other people's money for most insurers. However, life has been far more difficult in aggregate. The property casualty industry almost invariably operates at an underwriting loss. Um, when that loss is large, float becomes expensive, sometimes devastatingly so. Insurers have generally earned a poor returns for a simple reason. They sell a commodity-like product. Policy forms are standards, and the product is available for many suppliers, some whom are mutual companies owned by policyholders rather than stockholders with profit goals that are limited. Moreover, most insurers don't care from whom they buy. Customers buy the million say, I need some Gillette plates or I'll have a cook, but we wait in vain for it like a national and dunny policy, please. Consequently, price competition and insurance is usually fierce. Think airline seats. So you may ask how do British insurance operations overcome the dismal economics of industry and achieve some measure of insuring competitive advantage. We have attacked that problem several ways. Let's look at first at NICO strategy. When we purchased a company, a specialist in commercial auto and general liability insurance that did not appear to have any attributes that would overcome the industry's con troubles. It was well known, had no informational advantage. The company has never had an actuary. It was not a low-cost operator and t- sold through journal agents, a method many people show outdated. Nevertheless, for almost all the past 38 years, an ICO has been a star performer. Indeed, had we not made this acquisition, Brick Rochester would be lucky to be worth half of what it is today. What we had going for us in managerial reminds that most insurers find impossible to replicate. Take a look at the facing page. Can you imagine any public company embracing a business model that would lead to the decline in revenue that we experienced from 1986 through 1999? That colossal slide that should be emphasized did not occur because business wasn't obtainable. Many built in premium dollars were to be available to NICA had we only been willing to cut prices, but we instead consistently priced them make a profit, not not to match our optimi- more optimistic competitors. We never left customers, but they left us. Most American business harbor an institutional imperative, rejects extended decrease in volume. What CEO wants to report this shell rose that not only did business contract last year, but it will continue to drop insurance the urge to keep writing business, also intensified because the consequences of foolishly priced policies may not become apparent. For some time, if an insurer is opportunistic and it's reserving, reported earnings will be overstated in years may pass before true loss costs are revealed. A form of solitary deception that nearly destroyed Geico in the early 1970s. Portrait of a disciplined underwriter, National Indemnity Company. Here, 1980, 1981, 1982, 1983, 59.6 dollars, 59.9, 52.5, 58.2, 52.2, 162.2, 163.2, 163.2, 163.2, 163.2, 163.2, 163.2, 163.2, 163.2, 163.2, 163.2, 163.2, 163.2, 163.2, 163.2, 
true. Nineteen nineteen are probably close to correct because the years are so mature in the sense that they have few claims still outstanding. The more recent the year, the more guesswork is involved. In particular, the results shrunk for two thousand three, two thousand four are apt to change significantly. Finally, there is a fear factor at work in that shrinking business usually leads to layoffs. To avoid pink slip, employees will rationalize inadequate pricing, telling themselves that poorly priced businesses be tolerated in order to keep the organization intact. And there's a reason some team happy. If this course isn't followed, these employees will argue the company will not participate in the recovery that they invariably feel is just around the corner. To combat employees' natural tendency to save their own skins, we have always promised Nico's workforce that no one will be fired because of declining volume. However, severe contraction this is not Donald Trump's sort of place. Nico is not labor intensive and, as the table suggests, can live with the excess overhead. It can't live, however, with underpriced business and the breakdown in underwriting discipline that accompanies it. An insurance organization doesn't, doesn't care deeply about underwriting under profit. This year is unlikely to cure the next year either. Either. Naturally, a business that follows a no layoff policy must be especially careful to avoid overstaffing when times are good. 30 years ago, Tom Murphy, then CEO of Cap Cities, drove this point home to me with a hypothetical tale about an employee who asked his boss for permission to hire an assistant. The employee assumed that adding $20,000 to the annual payroll would be inconsequential, but his boss told him the proposal should be evaluated as a $3 million decision given that an additional person would probably cost at least an amount of over his lifetime factoring in, raises benefits and other expenses more people, more toilet paper, and unless the company fell on very hard times, the employee added would be unlikely to be dismissed, however marginal his contributions to the business. It takes real fortune to embed deep within a company's culture to operate as Nico does. Anyone exam- examining the table can scan years from 1986 to 1999 quickly. But living the day after day with dwindling volume while competitors are boasting of and reaping Wall Street applause is an experience few managers can tolerate. Nico, however, has had four CEOs since it since it had since its formation in 1940 and none have bent. It should be noted that only one of four graduated from college. Our experience tells us that extraordinary ability is largely innate. The current managerial star makes that superstar at Nico is Don Worcester. Yes, he's a graduate who has been running things since 1989. His slugging percentage is right up there with Barry Bonds because, like like Barry, Don will accept a walk rather than a swing at a bad pitch. Don has now amassed $950 million afloat at Nico. That over time is almost certain to be proved the negative cost kind. Because insurance price is falling, Don's volume will soon decline very significantly. And as it does, Charlie and I will applaud him ever more loudly. Another way to prosper in a commodity type business is to be the low cost operator among auto insurers operating on a broad scale. Geico holds that church title for Nico, as we have seen, an ebb and flow business model makes sense, but a company holding a low-cost advantage must pursue an unrelenting foot to the floor strategy, and that's just what we do at Geico. A century ago, when autos first appeared, the property casualty industry operated as a cartel to major companies, most of which were based in the Northeast, established bureau rates, and that was it. No one cut prices to attract business. Instead, insurers competed for strong, well-regarded agents, a focus that produces high commissions for agents and high prices for consumers. In 1992, State Farm was formed by George Marshall, a farmer from Myrna, Illinois, who aimed to take advantage of the pricing umbrella maintained by the high-cost giant of the industry. State Farm employed a captive agency force, a system keeping its acquisition costs lower than those incurred by the bureau insurers, whose independent agents successfully played off one company against another. With its low-cost structure, State Farm eventually captured about 25% of the personal lines, auto and homeowners business far out outdistancing its one mighty competitor, Allstate, formed in 1931, put a similar distribution system in plan to place, and soon became the runner-up in personal lines to State Farm. Capitalism had worked its magic, and these low-cost operations looked unstoppable. But a man named Leah Goldwyn had an idea of an even more efficient auto insurer, and with a skimpy $200,000 started Geico in 1936. Goldwyn's plan was to eliminate the agent entirely, and went to deal and said directly with the auto owner why he asked himself should there be any unnecessary and expensive links in the distribution mechanism when the product auto insurance was both mandatory and costly purchase of business insurance. He reasoned, might have wanted corporate financial advice, but when consumers know that what they need in auto and policy, that was a powerful insight. Originally, Geico mailed its low-cost messages to limited audience of government employees. Later, it widened its horizon and shifted its marketing emphasis to the phone, working inquiries that came from broadcast and print advertising, and today the Internet is coming on strong. Between 1936 and 1975, Geico grew from a standing start to a 4% market share, becoming the country's fourth-largest auto insurer during most of this period. The company was superbly managed, achieving both excellent volume gains and high profits. 
I looked unstoppable, but after my friend and hero, Laura Merle Davidson, retired as the CEO in 1970, his successor soon made a huge mistake by underserving for losses. This produced faulty cost information, which in turn produced inadequate pricing by 1976. Geico was on the brink of failure. Jack Byron then joined Geico as CEO and almost single-handedly saved the company by heroic efforts that included major price, price increases. Through Geico's survival, required these policyholders flood the company, and by 1980, its market share had fallen to 1.8%. Subsequently, the company embarked on some unwise diversification moves. The shift the emphasis away from its extraordinary business, stunning Geico's growth, and by 1993, its market share had grown only fractionally to 1.9%. Then Tony nicely took charge. And what difference that's made in 2005, Geico will probably secure a 6% market share. Better yet, Tony has matched growth with profitability. Indeed, Geico delivers all of its consistent major benefits in 2004 as customers saved $1 billion or so compared to what they would otherwise have paid for coverage. As they say, associates are earned $191 million profit sharing bonus at average 24.3% salary. And as owner said, us enjoyed excellent financial returns. There's more good news. When Jack Byrne was res- rescuing the company in 1976, New Jersey refused to grant him the... Rates he needed to operate profitably, he therefore promptly and pro- pro- properly withdrew from the state. Subsequently, Geico avoided both New Jersey and Massachusetts, recognizing the two jurisdictions in which insurers were this 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 struggle. In 2003, however, New Jersey took a new look at its chronic auto insurance problems and enacted legislation that would curb fraud and allow insurers to prepare a fair playing field. Even so, one might have expected the state's bureaucracy to make sure slow and difficult, but just the opposite occurred. Holly Beck, a New Jersey insurance commissioner who would be a success in any line of work, was determined to turn the laws intended to reality with her staff's cooperation. Geico ironed out the details for entering the state and was licensed last August. Since then, we received a response from New Jersey drivers at this multiple of my expectations. We are now serving 140,000 policyholders. About 4% of the New Jersey market is saving them substantial sums as we do drivers every word of mouth recommendations. And once we hear from a New Jersey, pro- New Jersey prospect or closure rate, the percentage of policies issued to inquiries received is far higher than the state and the national uh, nationally. We make no claim, of course, that we can save everyone money. Some companies using rating systems that are different from ours will offer certain class of drivers a lower rate than we do, but we believe Geico offers the lowest price more often than any other national company that serves all segments of the public. In addition, most states, including New Jersey, break charge shareholders receive an 8% discount, so gamble 15 minutes of your time and go to geico.com. or call 800-847-7536 to see whether you can save big money, which you might want to use, of course, to buy other break charge products. Reinsurance insurance sold to other insurers who wish to lay off part of the risk they have assumed should not be a commodity product. At bottom, any insurance policy is simply a promise, and as everyone knows, promises vary enormously in their quality. As a primary insurance level, nevertheless, just who makes promises often the minor importance in personal lines. Insurance, for example, states levy assessment and solvent companies to pay the policyholders of companies that go broke in the business insurance field. The same arrangement applies to workers' compensation policies, protected policies of these types. Account for about 60% of the property casualty industry volume. Prudently run, insurers are irritated by the need to subsidize poor reckless management elsewhere, but that's why the way it is. Other forms of business insurance at the primary level involve promises that carry greater risk for insured. When your life's insurance, home insurance were run to the ground, for example, their promises have proved to be worthless. Consequently, many holders of their business policies, other than those covering workers' compensation, suffered painful losses. The solvency risk in primary policy, however, pales in comparison to that lurking in reinsurance policies. When your insurance goes broke, staggering losses almost always track the primary companies it has dealt with. This risk is far from minor. Geico has suffered tens of millions in losses from its careless selection of reinsurers in the early 1980s, where it true mega catastrophe to occur in the next decade or two, and it's a real possibility. Some reinsurers would not survive the largest insured loss to date is the World Trade Center disaster, which cost the insurance industry an estimated $35 billion. Hurricane Andrew cost the insurers about $15.5 billion in 1992. Though that loss would be far higher in today's dollars, both events rocked the insurance and reinsurance world, but a $100 billion event or a larger catastrophe remains a possibility of either a particularly severe or or hurricane is just the wrong place. Far the significant hurricane stuck forward during 2004, causing an aggregate of $25 billion or so in insured losses. Two of these, Charlie and Ivan, could not have done at least three times the damage they did had they entered U.S. not far from their actual landing points. Many insurers regard $100 billion industry losses unthinkable and won't even plan for it. But at Breakshire, we're fully prepared. Our share of the loss will probably be 3% to 5% in earnings. From our investment and other business would comfortably exceed the cost when the day after it arrives, Breakshire checks will clear. Though the hurricanes hit us with a $1.25 billion loss, our insurance operations did 
Bowl last year. Adrenaline Ray, John Brandon, has restored a long admired culture of underwriting discipline that for a time had lost his way. The excellent results he realized in 2004 in the current business, however, were offset by adverse development from the years before he took the helm. At Nico's reinsurance operation, Ajit Jain continues to successfully underwrite huge risk that no other reinsurer is willing or is able to accept. Are these valid to break is enormous? Our insurance manager maximized the competitive strengths I've mentioned in this section. Again, the leverage first class and rating results last year. As a consequence, our float was better than costless. Here's the scorecard. Insurance operation, John Ray, BH Insurance, Geico as a primary total. Underwriting profit in millions of dollars. 2004, $3, 417, $970. So one hundred sixty one one thousand five hundred fifty one dollars two thousand four twenty three thousand one hundred twenty dollars fifteen thousand two hundred seventy eight five thousand nine hundred sixty one thousand seven hundred thirty six forty six thousand ninety four dollars two thousand three twenty three thousand six hundred fifty four dollars thirteen thousand nine hundred forty eight five thousand two hundred eighty seven one thousand three hundred thirty one forty four thousand two hundred twenty includes an additional to a national identity a variety of other exceptional insurance businesses run by Rod Eldred John Kisler Tom Nernay and Don Toll Berkshire's flood increased one point nine billion. In 2004, even though if you're insured, opted commute, that is in wine, certain reinsurance contracts, we agreed to such commutations only when we will the economics are favorable to us after giving due weight to what we might earn in the future on the money we're returning. To summarize last year, we, 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 paid, we're, we were paid more than $1.5 billion to hold an average of about $45.2 billion in 2005. Pricing will be less attractive and has been nevertheless absent a mega catastrophe. We have a decent chance of achieving no coast float, float against this year. Finance and finance products. Last year in this section, we discussed the potpourri of activities in this report. We'll skip over several that are now of lesser importance. Burkeja is down. The tag ends. Valley Capital has added other investors, negating our expectation we would need to consolidate its financial, its ours, and the trading operation night run continues to shrink. But of the both, both, both of Berkshire's leasing operations are bounded last year at court. Office furniture or earnings remained inadequate but are trending upward. Extra disposed of its container and intermodal business in order to concentrate on trade and leasing. Long is strong suit. Overhead has been reduced. Asset utilization is up and decent. Profits are not being achieved under Bill France, the company's new CEO. The wind down of January securities continues. We decided to exit the derivative operations three years ago, but getting out is easier said than done. The derivative instruments are purported to be highly liquid, and though we have had the benefit of benign market while liquidating ours, we still had 2,890 contracts outstanding at year end, down from 23,218 at the peak. Like hell, derivative trading is easy to enter but difficult to leave. Other similar trades come to mind as well. Generous derivative contracts have always been required to be marketed to market, and I believe the company's management consciously tried to make realistic marks. The market price of derivatives, however, it can be very fuzzy in a world with much settlement of a transaction, and sometimes that gets weighted and often involves multiple variables as well. In the interim, the marks influence the managerial and trading bonuses that are paid annually. It's small wonder that phantom profits are often recorded. Investors should understand that all types of financial institutions, rapid growth sometimes mask major underlying problems and occasional fraud. The real test of earnings power of a derivatives operation is what it achieves after operating for an extended period in a no growth mode. You only learn who has been swimming naked when the tide goes out. After four years, we finally generated a little synergy at Berkshire. Clayton Homes is doing well, and that's in part due to its associated with the Berkshire. The manufactured home industry continues to reside in the intensive care unit of corporate America, having sold less than 135000 New homes, last year about the same as in 2003, volume in these years was the lowest since 1962 and was also only about 40% of annual sales during the years 1995 to 1999. That era, characterized by responsible financing and naive funders, was a fool's paradise for the industry. Because one major lender after another has fled the field, financing continues to bed evil. Manufactured retailers and purchasers of manufactured homes, sure, Berkshire support has proven valuable to Clayton. We stand ready to find whatever makes sense, and last year Clayton's management found much that qualified. As we explained in our 2003 report, we believe in using borrowed money to support profitable interest-bearing receivables. At the beginning of last year's, we had borrowed $2 billion to, to relent to Clayton at the 1 percentage point markup, and by January 2005, the total was $7.35 billion. Most of the dollars added were borrowed us on January 4, 2005 to finance a season portfolio that Clayton purchased on December 30, 2004 from a bank exiting the business. We now have two additional portfolio purchases in the works totaling about $1.6 billion, but it's quite unlikely that we will secure others of any significance. Therefore, Clayton's receivable in which or- originations will roughly offset payoffs will probably hover around $9 billion for some time and should lower steady earnings. This pattern will be far different from that of the the past, in which Clayton, like all major players in this industry, securitized its receivables, causing earnings to be front-ended in the last two years. The securitization market has dried up. The limited funds available today come only at higher costs and with harsh terms. Had Clayton remained independent in this period, it would have had major earnings and struggled with financing. In April, Clayton completed the acquisition of Oakwood Homes and is now the industry's largest producer and retailer of manufactured homes. We love putting more assets in the hands of Kevin 
Clayton, the company CEO, he's a prototype Berkshire manager. Today, Clayton has 11,837 employees, up from 7,136 when we purchased it. And Charlie and I are pleased that Berkshire has been useful in facilitating this growth. For simplicity's safety stake, we include all of the Clayton earnings in the sector. Through a sizable portion of these are derived from areas other than consumer finance. Trading ordinary income, generate securities, live and annuity operation, value capital, Rikaja, leasing operations, manufactured housing finance, Clayton, and other income before capital gains, trading capital gains, total. Includes all liabilities from date of acquisition, August 7, 2003. In Million dollars. Pre tax earnings 2004, 264 dollars, 44, 57, 30, 192, 220, 78, 584, 1750, 2334 dollars. 2003, 355 dollars, 99, 85, 31, 101, 34, 37, 75, 619, 1215, 1834 dollars. Interest bearing liabilities 2004, 5751 dollars, 5437, 2467, not available. Blank, 391, 3,636, not available, 2003, 7,826, 8,041, 2,331, NA, 525, 482, 2,032, NA. Manufacturing, service, and retailing operations. Our activities in this category cover the waterfront, but let's look at the summary balance sheet and earnings statement consolidating the entire group. <clears throat> balance sheet, 1231.04 in million dollars. Assets, cash and equivalents, accounts and notes receivable, inventory, other current assets, total current assets. Eight hundred ninety nine dollars, two thousand seventy four, three thousand eight hundred forty two, two hundred fifty four, eight thousand sixty nine. Goodwill and other intangibles, fixed assets, other assets, eight thousand six hundred sixty two, six thousand one hundred sixty one, one thousand forty four, twenty three thousand six hundred thirty six. Liabilities and equity, notes payable, one thousand one hundred forty three dollars. Other current liabilities, four thousand six hundred eighty five dollars. Total current liabilities, five thousand eight hundred twenty eight. Deferred taxes, two hundred forty eight. Term debt, other liabilities, one thousand nine hundred sixty five. Equity, fifteen thousand five hundred ninety five. Total. $23,636. Earnings statements in million dollars. Revenues, operating expenses, including depreciation of $766 in 2004 and $605 in 2003. Interest expense, net pre tax earnings, and income taxes. Net income taxes. 2004, $44,142. $41,604.57. $2,481,941. $1,540. 2003, $32,106. $21,805. 64 to 2,157, 813, $1,144. It's a cladic group of which sells products ranging from daily bars to fractional interest and Boeing 737s earned a very respectable 21.7% on average tangible net worth. Last year, compared to 20.7% in 2003, it's noteworthy that these operations used only minor financial leverage in achieving these returns. Clearly, we own some very good businesses. We purchased many of them. However, substantial premiums to net worth, a matter just reflecting the goodwill item shown in the balance sheet, and that fact reduces earnings on an average current value to 9.9%. Here are the pre-tax earnings for the larger categories of units. Building products, shop industries, apparel and footwear, retail and jewelry, home furnishing and candy, flight services, McLean, other businesses. From date of extra in May 23, 2003. Pre tax earnings in million dollars 2,443, 466, 325, 2015, 191, 228, 413, 2,481. 2003, 559, 436, 289, 224, 72, 150, 427, 2,157. In the building product sector in that Shaw, we've experienced staggering cost increases for both raw materials and energy. By December, for example, steel costs at Maytech, who primarily business connectors for roof truss, trusses, were running 100% over a year earlier, and Maytech uses 665 million pounds of steel every year. Nevertheless, the company continues to be in a standard performance as we purchased Maytech. In 2001, Gene Toombs, its CEO, has made some brilliant bolt on acquisition and is on his way to creating a mini Berkshire. Shaw, Shaw fielded a barrage of price increases in its main fiber materials during the year. Hit that added more than $300 million to its cost. When you walk on a carpet, you're in. In effect, stepping on processed oil, though we followed these hikes and cost of the price increases of our own, there was an inevitable lag. Therefore, margins narrowed as air progress and remain under pressure today. Despite these roadblocks, Shaw, led by Bob Shaw, and Julian Saul earned an outstanding 25.6% on tangible equity in 2004. The company is a powerhouse and has a bright future. In apparel, fruit will increase unit sales by 10 million dozen or 14%, with shipments of intimate apparel for women and girls growing by 31%. Charlie, who is far more knowledgeable than I am, the subject assures me that women are not wearing more underwear. With this expert input, I can only conclude that our market share in the women's category must be growing rapidly. Thanks to John Holland, fruit is on the move. A smaller operation, Garen, also had an excellent year, led by Samuel Lichensen and Jerry Camiel. 
Daniel. This company manufactures the popular granules line for children. Next time you're in Walmart, check out this imaginative product. Among our retailers, Ben Bridge Jewelry and RC Willie Home Furnishing were particularly sales last year. At Ben Bridge, same store sales grew 11.4%, the best gain among the publicly held jewelers who's reported to have seen. Additionally, the company's profit margin widened. Last year was not a fluke. During the past decade, the same store sales gains of the company have averaged 8.8%. Ed and John Bridge are fourth generation managers and run the business exactly as if it were their own, which is in various respect, except for the brochure's name on the stock certificates. The bridges have expanded successfully by securing the right locations, and more importantly, by staffing these stores with enthusiastic and knowledgeable associates. Will will move to Minneapolis Saint Paul this year. A Utah-based RC Willie, the gains from the expansion have been even even more dramatic, with 41.9 percent of 2004 sales com- coming from out-of-state stores that didn't exist before 1999. The company also improved its profit margin in 2004, propelled by its two two new stores in Las Vegas. I would like to tell you that their stores were my idea and truth. I thought they were mistakes. I knew, of course, how brilliantly Bull Child had run the RC Willie operation in Utah, where its market share had long been huge, but I felt our close on Sunday policy would prove disasters away from home, even if our first out-of-state store in Boise, which was highly successful, let me unconvinced. I kept asking whether Las Vegas residents conditioned to seven days a week retailers would adjust to us. Our first Las Vegas store opened in 2001, answered this question in a resounding manner, immediately becoming our number one unit. Bill, Bill and Scott Hamas has a successor as CEO and proposed a second Las Vegas store only about 20 minutes away. I felt the expansion would cannibalize the first unit, adding significant cost by only modest sales. The result, each store is now doing about 26% more volume than any other store in the chain. It's consistently throwing large year over year gains. RC Willie will soon open in Reno. Before making this commitment, Bill and Scott again asked for uh, advice. Initially, I was pretty puffed up about the fact that they were consulting me, but then it dawned on me that the opinion of someone who is always wrong has its own special utility to decision makers. Earnings improved in flight services at Flight Safety, the world leader in pilot training. Profits rose as corporate aviation rebounded. Our business with regional airlines increased. We now operate 283 cylinders with an original cost of $1.2 billion. Pilots are trained one at a time on this expensive equipment. This means that as much as $3.50 of capital investment is required to reduce $1 of revenue. With this level of capital intensity, flight safety requires very high operating margins in order to obtain reasonable returns on capital, which means that utilization rates are all important. Last year, flight safety's return on tangible equity improved to 15.1 one percent from eight point four percent in two thousand three. In another 2004 event, Al Yatsi, who found flight safety in 1951 with $10,000, turned over the CEO position to Bruce Whitman, a 43-year veteran at the company, but Al's not going anywhere. I won't let him. Bruce shares Al's conviction that flying an aircraft is privileged to be extended to only people who are able to receive the highest quality of training and are undeniably com- competent. A few years ago, Charlie was asked to intervene with Al on behalf of a tycoon friend whom flight safety had flunked. Al's reply, Charlie, tell your pal he belongs in the back of the plane, not the cockpit. Flight safety number one customer is NetJets, our craft fractional ownership subsidiary, it's 2,100 pilots spend an average of 18 days a year in training. Additionally, these pilots fly only one aircraft type, whereas many flight operations juggle pilots among several types. NetJets' high standards on both fronts are two the reasons I signed up with the company years before Berkshire bought it. Full is an important in my decision to both use and buy NetJets, however, was the fact that the company was managed was managed by... Rich Santuli, the creator of professional ownership industry and a fanatic about safety and service, I viewed the selection of a flight provider as akin to picking a brain surgeon you simply want the best. Let someone else experiment with a little bitter. Last year, NetJets again gained about 70% of the net new business measured by dollar value going to the four companies that dominate the industry. A portion of our growth came from the 25-hour card offered by Marquis Jet Partners. Marquis is not owned by NetJets, but instead a customer that repackages a purchase and makes from us into smaller packages that it sells through its card. Marquis deal exclusively with NetJets just utilizing the power of our reputation as marketing. Our U.S. contracts, including Marquis customers, grew from 3,877 to 4,167 in 2004 versus approximately 1,200 contracts when Berkshire bought NetJets. In 1998, some clients, including me, entered into multiple contracts because they wished to use more than one type of aircraft, selecting for any given trip whichever type best fits the mission at hand. NetJets earned a modest amount in the U.S. last year, but what we earned domestically was largely offset by losses in Europe. We are now, however, generating real momentum abroad. Contracts including 25-hour cards that we ourselves market in Europe increased from 364 to 690 during the year. We'll again have a very significant European loss in 2005, but domestic earnings will likely put us back in the black overall. Europe has been expensive for net jets, far more expensive than I anticipated, but it is essential to building a flight operation that will forever be in class by itself. Our U.S. owners already want a quality service, whether they travel and their wish for flight hours abroad is certain to grow dramatically in the decades ahead. Last year, U.S. owners made 2003 flights in Europe, up to 22% from the previous 
shirt and 137% from 2000. Recent purchases are European owners made 1067 flights in the US, up 65% from 2003 to 139% from 2000. Investments. We show below our common stock investment. Those that had market value more than six hundred billion dollars at the end of two thousand four are itemized. Shares one hundred fifty one million six hundred ten thousand seven hundred two hundred million ninety six million fourteen million two hundred fifty thousand six hundred six million seven hundred eight thousand seven hundred sixty twenty four million two billion thirty hundred thirty eight thousand nine hundred sixty one thousand one million seven hundred twenty seven thousand seven hundred sixty five fifty six million four hundred forty eight thousand three hundred eighty one million seven hundred twenty four thousand two hundred Company, American Express Company, the Coca Cola Company, Gillette Company, Eternal Block Incorporated, Mimenti Buying Incorporation, Moody's Corporation, Petro China, H Shares for Equivalent, The Washington Post Company, Wells Fargo and Company, White Mountains Insurance, others, Total Common Stocks. 12.3104 percentage of company owned 12 12.1, 8.3, 9.7, 8.7, 5.8, 16.2, 1.3, 18.1, 3.3, 6.0. Cost in millions, $1,472, 1299 in millions, $8,546, This is actual purchase price and also our tax basis. GWP cost differs in few cases because of write-ups or write-downs that have been required. Some people may look at this table and view it. As a list of stocks to be bought and sold based upon chart patterns, brokers' opinions, or estimates of near term earnings, Charlie and I ignore such distractions and instead view our holdings as fractional ownership in businesses. This is an important st- distinction indeed. This thinking has been the cornerstone of in my investment behavior since I was 19. At that time, I read Brain Graham's Intelligent Investor, and the scales fell from my eyes. Previously, I had been entranced by the stock market but didn't have a clue about how to invest. Let's look at how the business of our big four, American Express, Coca-Cola, Gillette, and Wells Fargo, have fared since we bought into these companies. As the table shows, we invested $3.83 billion in the four by the way of multiple transactions between May 1988 and October 2003. On a composite basis, our dollar-weighted purchase date is July 1992. By year end 2004, therefore, we had held these business interests on a weighted basis about 12 to one half years. In 2004, British share of the group earnings amounted to $1.2 billion. These earnings might legitimately be considered normal. True, they were spoiled because Gillette and Wells Fargo omitted the option cost and representation of earnings, but on the other hand, they were reduced because Coke had non recurring write off. <clears throat> Our share of earnings of these four companies has grown almost every year now. Amounts to about 31.3% of our costs. Our cash distributions have also grown consistently, totaling $434 million in 2004, about 11.3% of costs. All in all, the big four have delivered us satisfactory, though far from spectacular business result. That's true as well as our experience in market with the group. Since our original purchase valuation gains have somewhat exceeded earnings growth because price earnings ratio have increased. On a year to year basis, however, the business and market performance have often diverged, sometimes to an extraordinary degree. During the Great Bubble, market value bis- gains far outstripped the performance of the business in the aftermath of the bubble. The reverse was true. Clearly, big share results would have been far better if I had caught a swing on the pendulum. That may seem easy to do when one looks true, an always clean rearview mirror. Unfortunately, however, it's a windshield through which investors must peer in the glasses invariably fogged. Our each position adds to the difficulty of our nimbly dancing in and out of holdings as valuations swing. Nevertheless, I can properly be criticized for merely clucking about those valuations during the bubble rather than acting on my views, though I said at the time that certain of the stocks we held were priced at themselves, I underestimated just how severe the overvaluation was. I talked when I should have walked. What Charlie and I like a action now, we don't enjoy sitting on $43 billion of cash equivalents that are earning paltry result, res, returns. Instead, we yearn to buy more fractional interests similar to those we now own, or better still, more large business outright. We'll do either, however, only when purchase can be made at prices that offers the prospect of reasonable return on nerve investment. We've repeatedly emphasized the, that the realized gains that we report quarterly or annually are meaningless for analytical purposes. We have a huge amount of unrealized gains on our books, and are thinking about when enough to cash them depends on our all desire to report earnings at one specific time or another. A further complication in our reported gains occurs because GWP requires that foreign exchange contracts be marked to market, a stipulation that causes unrealized gains or losses in these holdings to flow through, through our published earnings as if we had sold our positions. Despite the problems enumerated, you may be interested in the breakdown of the gains we reported in 2003 and 2004. They later reflect actual sales like, except in the case of currency, gains which are a combination of sales and marks to market. Category, common stocks, the U.S. government bonds, junk bonds, foreign exchange contracts, other, total, Pre-tax gain in million dollars, 2004, $870, 104, 738, 1839, 47, 3496. 2003, 
$1,125,000, The junk bond profits included foreign exchange component when we bought these bonds in 2001-2002. We focused first off, of course, on the credit quality of the issuers, all of which were American corporations. Some of these companies have ever had issued bonds that dominated in foreign currencies. Because of our views on the dollar, we favored these for a purchase when they were available. As an example, we bought $254 million of level 3 bonds, 10 to 3 fourths percent of 2008 and 2001 at 551 point seven percent of power and sold these at eighty five percent of par in December two thousand four. This issue was traded in Euros that cost us eighty eight cents at the time of purchase, but that bought one point twenty nine dollars when we sold to us of our one hundred sixty million to three million dollars overall gain. About eighty five million dollars came from the market's revised opinion about level three's credit quality with the remaining seventy eight million dollars halting from depreciation of the euro. In addition, we received cash interest during our holding period that amounted to about twenty five percent annually in our dollar cost. The media continues to report that Buffett buys this or their stock statements like these are almost always based on filings Berkshire makes with the SEC and are therefore wrong. As I've said before, the story should share Berkshire bias. Portrait of the Disciplined Investors, Lou Simpson. Year 1980, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004. Return from Geico Equities, 237 5.4%, 4.58%, 36.0%, 21.8%, 35.8%, 38.7%, 10.0%, 3.0%, 4.6%, 13.4%, 13.8%, 29.2%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%, 24.5%
lean towards not so benign neglect. A 318-page congressional study of the consequences of unremitting trade deficits was published in November 2000 and has been gathering dust ever since. The study was ordered after the deficit hit and then alarming $263 billion in 1999. But last year, it had risen to $618 billion. Charlie and I should be emphasized to believe that a true trade that is an exchange of goods and services with other countries is enormously beneficial for both of us. And then, last year, we had $1.15 trillion of such honest-to-God trade. And the more of this, better. But as noted, our country also purchased an additional $618 billion in goods and services from the rest of the world that was unreciprocated. That is a second figure and one that has important consequences. The balancing item of this one-way pseudo trade in economics, there is always an offset as the transfer falls from U.S. to the rest of the world. The transfer may internalize in the form of IOUs or private or governmental institution gifts to foreigners by way of assuming ownership of assets such as stocks and real estate. In either case, Americans end up owning a reduced portion of our country, while non-Americans own a greater part. This force feeding of American wealth to the rest of the world is now proceeding at the rate of $1.8 billion in a daily increase of 20% since I wrote you last year. Consequently, other countries and their citizens now own a net of about $3 trillion of the U.S. A decade ago, their not ownership was negligible. The mention of the trillions num- numbs most brains, a further source of confusion is that the current account deficit, the sum of three items, the most important by far being the trade deficit, and our national budget deficit are often lumped as twins. They're anything but. They have different causes and different consequences. A budget deficit in no way reduces a portion of national pie that goes to Americans as long as other countries and their citizens have no net ownership in the U.S. 100% of our country's output belongs to our citizens under any budget scenario, even when involving huge deficit. A large family in Washington goods, Americans will argue through legislators to how government should receive the national output. That's who pays taxes and who receives governmental benefits. If entitlement promised from an earlier date have been examined, family members will angrily debate among themselves as to who feels the pain. Maybe taxes will go up, maybe promises will be modified, maybe more internal debt will be issued, but when the fight is finished, all the family's huge pie remains available for its members. However, it is devalued, no slice must be sent abroad. <coughs> Large and persisting current account deficits produce an entirely different results as the time passes and as claims against us grow. We own less and less of what we produce and affect the rest of the world and just an ever growing role to an American output. Here, we are like family consistently overspends its income. As time passes, the family finds that it's working more and more for the finance company and less for itself. Should we continue to run current account deficits comparable to those now prevailing, then the ocean of the U.S. by other countries and their citizens at the decade from now will almost amount to roughly $11 trillion. And if foreign investors were to earn only 5% of that net holding, we would need to send a net of $5.5 trillion of goods and service abroad every year merely to service the U.S. investments and held by foreigners. At that day, a decade about our GDP would probably total about $18 trillion, assuming low inflation, which is far from a sure thing. Therefore, our U.S. family would then be delivering 3% of its annual output to the rest of the world simply as a tribute to the overindulgence of the past. In this case, unlike that involving budget deficits, the sons would truly pay for the sins of their fathers. This annual royalty paid the world, which would not disappear unless the U.S. massively underconsumed and began to run consistent and large trade surpluses, would undoubtedly produce significant political unrest in the U.S. Americans would still be living very well indeed better than now because of the growth in our economy, but they would shaft the idea of virtually paying tribute to their creditors and owners abroad. A country that is not aspiring to an ownership society will not find happiness. It only starts probably short from emphasis. A sure crop society, but that's precisely where our trade policy supported by Republicans and Democrats alike are taking us. Many prominent U.S. financial figures, both in and out of the government, have stated that our current account deficits cannot persist. For instance, the minutes of the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee of June 29, 2004, say the staff noted that outside external deficits could not be sustained definitely, but despite the constant handwriting by luminaries, they offer no substantive suggestions to the burgeoning imbalance. In the article I wrote for Fortune 16 months ago, I warned that the gently declining dollar would not provide the answer, and so far it hasn't, yet policymakers continue to hope for a soft hand landing, meanwhile counseling other countries to simulate read and flight, their economies and uh, Americans to save more. In my view, these admonitions miss the mark. There are deep-rooted structural problems that will cause America to continue to run a huge current account deficit and less trade policy, either change materially or the dollar declines by a degree that could prove unsettling to financial markets. Proponents of the trade status quo are fond of decoding Adam Smith. What is prudence and the conduct of every family can scarce be folly? In of a great kingdom, if a foreign country can supply us with commodities cheaper than we ourselves, can make it better buy it of themselves with some part of the produce of our own industry, employed in a way which we have some advantage. I agree. Note, however, that Mr. Smith's statement refers to trade of product for product, not of wealth for product, and our country is doing to the tune of $0.6 trillion annually. Moreover, I am sure that he would never have suggested that prudence consisted of his family selling off part of its farm every day in order to finance its overconsumption. Yet, that is just what the great kingdom called the United States is doing. If the U.S. was running a $0.6 trillion current account surplus, commentators worldwide would violently condemn our policy viewing it as an extreme form of mercantilism, along discredited economic strategy under which countries 
fostered export discouraged imports and piled up treasures would condemn such a policy as well but in effort if not in intent the rest of the world is practicing mercantilism in respect to the U.S. an act made possible by our vast store and assets and our pristine credit history indeed the world would never let any other countries use a credit card denominated in its own currency to the insatiable extent we are employing ours presently most foreign investors are sanguine they may view us as spending junkies but they know we are rich junkies as well our spencer of behavior won't however be tolerated indefinitely and though it's impossible to forecast just when and how the trade problem will be resolved it's impossible that the resolution will foster an increase in the value of our currency relative to that of our trading partners. We hope the U.S. adopts policy that will quickly and substantially reduce our current account deficit. True, our prompt solution would likely cost Berkshire to record losses on its foreign exchange contracts, but Berkshire's resource remain, remain heavily concentrated in dollar-based assets in both a strong dollar and a low inflation environment are very much in interest. If you wish to keep abreast of trade and currency matters, read the Financial Times. This London-based paper has long been the leading source of daily international financial news and now has an excellent American edition, both its reporting and commentary on trade or first class. And again, our usual caveat, macroeconomics is a tough game in which few people, Charlie and I included, have demonstrated skill. We may well turn out to be wrong in our currency judgment. Indeed, the fact that so many pundits now predict weakness for the dollar makes us uneasy. If so, our mistake will be very public. The irony is that if we choose the opposite course, Leaving all Berkshire assets in dollars, even as they decline significantly in value, no one would notice our mistakes. John Maynard Keynes said in his masterful The General Theory, Worldly wisdom teaches that it is better for reputation to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. Or to put it in less elegant terms, lemmings as a class may be derided but never does an individual lemming get criticized from a reputational standpoint. Charlie and I were in a clear list with our foreign exchange commitment, but we believe in managing Berkshire as we own 100% of it ourselves, and we're in the case we would not be following a dollar-only policy. Miscellaneous. Last year, I told you about the group of University of Tennessee finance students who played a key role in our $1.7 billion acquisition of Clayton Homes. Earlier, they had been brought to Omaha by their professor, Al Exer. He brings a class every year to tour Nebraska Furniture Mart and board time to eat at Goretz and have a Q&A session with me at Q at Pete's Plaza. These visitors, like those who come from our annual meeting, leave impressed by both the city and its friendly residents. Other colleges and universities have now come calling this school year. We will have the visiting class ranging in size from 30 to 100 students from Chicago, Dartmouth, Tuck, Delaware State, Florida State, Indiana, Iowa, Iowa State, Maryland, Nebraska, Northwest, Nazarene, Pennsylvania, Wharton, Stanford, Tennessee, Texas, Texas A&M, Toronto, Rodman Union in Utah. Most of the students are MBA candidates and have been impressed by their quality. They are keenly interested in business and investment, but their questions indicate that they also have more on their minds than simply making money. I always feel good after meeting them. At our sessions, I told the newcomers the story of the Tennessee group and its spotting of Clayton Homes. I do this in the spirit of the farmer who enters his hen house with the ostrich egg and marches the flock. I don't like to complain, girls, but this is just a small sample of what the competition is doing. To date, our new scouts have not bought its deals, but their mission in life has been made clear to them. You should be aware of an accounting role demand lead the stores or financial statements in a paint today gain tomorrow manner B- mm. Berkshire purchased life insurance policies from individual and corporations who would otherwise surrender them for cash. As a new holder of the policies, we pay any premiums that become due and ultimately when the original holder dies, collect the face value of the policies. The original policy holder is usually in good health when we purchase the policy. Still, the price we pay for it always above its cash surrender. Value CSV, sometimes the original policy holder has borrowed against the CSV to make premium payments. In that case, the remaining CSV will be tiny and our purchase price will be a large multiple of what the original policy holder would have received had he cash at my surrendering. It. Under accounting rules, we must immediately charge us to realize capital loss to excess over CSV that we pay upon purchasing the policy. We also must make additional charges each share for the amount by which the premium we pay to keep the policy in force exceed the increase in CSV. But obviously, we don't take these bookkeeping charges to represent economic losses. If we did, we wouldn't buy the policies. During 2004, we coordinated net losses from the purchase of policies and from the premium payments required to maintain them, totaling $207 million, which was charged against realized investment gains in our earnings statements, including other in the table on page 17. When the proceeds from this policies are received in the future will record the realized investment gain to excess over than the CSV. Two post-bubble governance reforms have been particularly useful at Berkshire and I fault myself for not putting them in place. We know because it was the first involves regular meetings of directors without CEO present. I've sat on 19 boards and on many occasions this process would have led to the plans plans ex- being examined more thoroughly. In a few cases, CEO changes that were needed would also have been made more promptly. There is no downside to this process and there are many possible benefits. The second reform concerns the whistleblower line and arrangement though which employees can send information to me and the board's audit committee without fear of reprisal. Berkshire's extreme decentralization makes this system particularly valuable both to me and the committee. In a sprawling city of 880,000, Berkshire current employee count not very fair that falls 
On Route 13 headquarters, most of the complaints we have received are if the guy next to me has bad breath variety. But on, the, on the occasion, I've learned of important problems that our subsidiaries that I otherwise would have missed. The issue raised are usually not of a type discoverable by audit, but relates instead to personal and business practices. Berkshire would be more valuable today if I had put it in a whistleblower line decades ago. Charlie and I love the idea of shareholders thinking and behaving like owners. Sometimes that requires them to be proactive in the learn or in larger institutional owners should lead the way. So far, however, the moves made by institutions have been less than or inspiring. Usually, they focus on minutiae and ignore the three questions that truly count. First, does the company have the right CEO? Second, is he overreaching in terms of compensation? Third, are proposed acquisitions more likely to create or destroy for, value, for share value? On such questions, the interests of the CEO many will differ from those of shareholders, directors, moreover, sometimes lack the knowledge for gumption. So overall, the CEO is therefore vital to large owners focus on these three questions and speak up when necessary. Instead, many simply follow a checklist approach to the issue du jour. Last year, I was on the receiving end of a judgment reached in a manner several institutional shareholders and their advisors decided I liked independence and Marilyn was the director of Coca-Cola. One group wanted me removed from the board and another simply wanted me booted from the audit committee. My first impulse was to secretly fund the group behind the second idea. Why anyone would wish to be in audit committee is beyond me. But since the director must be assigned to one committee or another and since Neil CEO wants me on his compensation committee, it's often been my law, law to get an audit committee assignment as it turned out the institutions that opposed me failed and I was reelected to the audit job. I thought of the urge to ask for a recount. Some institutions question my independence because, among other things, McLean and Dairy Queen buy lots of Coke products. Do they want us favor of Pepsi? But independence to define the web service is not subject to control by others. I also how anyone could control could conclude that a Coke purchase would control my decision making with the counterweight as the well being of eight billion dollars of Coke stock held by Berkshire. Assuming I'm even marginally rational elementary arithmetic should make it clear that my heart and mind belong to the owners of Coke, no t- not to its management. I can't resist Mentioning that Jesus understood the calibration of independence far more clearly than the, the statistic in institution, Matthew 6.21, he observed, For where your treasure is, there will be hot also. If it is a central investor, it will not should qualify as a treasure that dwarfs any profits Berkshire might earn on certain transactions with Coke. Measured by the biblical standards, the Berkshire board is a model. Every director is a member of a family, owning at least $4 million of stock. B, none of these shares were acquired from Berkshire via options or grants. C, no directors receive a committee, consulting board fees from the company that are more than a tiny portion of their annual income. And D, although we have a starting corporate indemnity arrangement, we carry no liability insurance for directors. At the Berkshire board, members travel the same road as shareholders. Charlie and I have seen so much behavior confirmed with Bible Treasure Point in our view. Based on our considerable boardroom experience, the least independent directors are likely to be. Those who receive an important fraction of their annual income from the fees they receive for board services and don't follow well, they're recommended for an election to other boards and thereby to boost their income further. Yet these are very board members, most often classes independent. Most directors of this type are decent people and do a first class job, but they wouldn't be even if they weren't tempted to support actions that would threaten their livelihood. Some may go on to succumb such temptations. Let's look at an example based upon circumstantial evidence. I have first hand knowledge of a recent acquisition proposal, not from Berkshire that was favored by management, but by the company investment banker, and slated to go forward at a price above the level that which stock had sold for some years or now and sells for. An additional number of directors favored transaction wanted to propose to shareholders. Several of their brethren, however, each of whom received board and committee fees totaling about $100,000 annually, scuttled their proposal, which meant that shareholders never learned of this multi-billion dollar offer. Non-management directors own little stock except for shares they had received from the company. Their open market purchase in recent years had meanwhile been nominal, even though the stock had sold far below the acquisition price proposed. In other words, these directors didn't want the shareholders to be offered X, even though they had consistently declined the opportunity to buy the stock for their own account fraction of X. I don't know which directors are both letting shareholders see the offer, but I do know that $100,000 an important portion of the annual income of some of those deemed independent, clearly meeting the Matthew 61, 621 definition of treasure. If the deal had gone through, these fees would have ended. Neither shareholders nor I will ever know what motivated the centers. Indeed, they themselves will not likely know, given that self-interest in a blur introspection. We do know one thing, though. At the same time, meeting at which the deal was directed, rejected, the board voted self-significant increase in director's fees. While we are on the subject of self-interest, let's turn again to the most important accounting mechanism still available to CEOs who wish to overstate earnings, the non-expensive stock options. The accomplices in perpetuating this absurdity have been many members of Congress who have defied the arguments put forth by all big four auditors, all members of the financial accounting standards, board, and virtually all investment professionals. I'm in closing an op-ed piece I wrote for the Washington Post describing a truly breathtaking bill 
that was passed 312 to 11 by the House last summer. Text of Senator Richard Shelby and Senator didn't ratify the House foolishness. And to his great credit, Bill Donaldson and the inventor, investor-minded chairman of the SEC has stood firm against massive political pressure generated by the check-waving CEOs who first muscled Congress in 1993 about the issue of option accounting and remedial tactics last year. Because the attempts to obfuscate the stock option issue continue to work, it's worth pointing out that no one, neither the FSAB, FASB or investors generally nor I are talking about restricting the use of options in any way. Indeed, my successor at Berkshire may well receive much of its pay via options, albeit logically structured on once in respect to one, an appropriate strike price, two, an escalation in price that reflects the retention of earnings, and three, abandon is quickly disposing of any shares purchased through options. We share arrangements that motivate managers, whether these be cash bonus or options, and if company is truly receiving value for the options that it uses, issues we sell. We see no reason why recording their cost should cut down on their use. The simple fact is that certain CEOs know their own compensation would be far more rationally determined if options were expensed. They also suspect that their stock would sell at a lower price if realistic accounting were employed, meaning that they would reap less in the market when they unloaded their personal holdings. Two, to these CEOs, such unpleasant prospects are a fate to be fought with all resources they have had, and even though the funds they use in that fight normally don't belong to them but are instead put up by their shareholders. Option expensing is scheduled to become mandatory on June 15th. You can therefore accept the intensified efforts to sell or masculine this road between now and then. Let your congressmen and senators know what you think on this issue. The annual meeting. There are two changes this year considering the annual meeting. First, we had scheduled meeting for the last Saturday in April. The 30th rather than the usual first Saturday in May, May, May this year month's Mother's Day fall in May 8th and would be unfair to ask the employees of Burside and Gardens to take care of us at that special time, so we've moved everything up a week. Next year, we'll return to our regular timing, holding the meeting on May 6, 2006. Additionally, we're changing the sequence of events on meeting day, April 30. This is the Dolly's the Rival will be open at QS Center at 7 a.m. and the movie will be shown at 8.30 at 9.30. However, we will go directly to the question and answer period, which will allow for lunch at the QS at 10. will last until 3. Then after a short res- recess, Charlie and I will convene the annual meeting at 3.15. We have made this change because a number of shareholders complained last year about the time consumed by two speakers who advocate a proposal of limited interest to the majority of the audience and who are no doubt relishing their chance to talk to a captive group of about 19,500. With their new procedures, those shareholders who wish to hear it all can stick around for the formal meeting and those who don't can leave or better yet shop. There will be plenty of opportunity for the past time in the exhibition hall that adjoins the meeting area. Kelly much more. The flow of Zig Field of Brickshire put on a magnificent shopping extravaganza last year and she says that was just a warm-up for this year. Kelly, I'm delighted to report this getting married in October. I'm giving her away and suggested that she make a little history by holding the wedding at the annual meeting. She balked, however, when Charlie insisted that he be the ring bearer. Again, we will showcase a 2,100 square foot clay and home featuring Acme brick, shawl carpet, John Mansfield insulation, Mitech fasteners, care free awnings and NFM furniture. Take a tour through the home, better yet, buy it. Geico will have a booth staffed by a number of its top counselors from around the country. All of them are ready to supply you with auto insurance quotes. In most cases, Geico will be able to give you a special shareholder's discount, usually 8%. The special offer is permitted by 45 of the 50 jurisdictions in which we operate. Bring the details of your existing insurance to check out whether we can save you money. On Saturday at the Omaha airport, we will have the usual array of aircraft from NetJets available for your inspection. Stop by the NetJets booth at the Key West to learn about viewing these planes. Come to Omaha by bus leaving on your new plane. The bookworm shop did the traffic business last year selling Berkshire-related books, displaying 18 titles. They sold 2,920 copies for $61,000. Since we charge the shop no rent, I must be getting soft. It gives shareholders a 20% discount this year. I've asked the bookworm to add Graham Allison's nuclear terrorism to the ultimate preventable catastrophe. I must... Read for those concerned with the safety of our country. In addition, the shop will be premier for Charlie's Almanac, a book compiled by Peter Kaufman. Scholars have far too long debated whether Charlie is the reincarnation of Ben Franklin. This book should title the question. An attachment to the approximate title that is enclosed with this report explains how you can obtain credential you will need for admission to the meeting and other events. A sort of plane, hotel, and car reservation we have again signed up. American Express 800-799-6634 to give you special help to do a terrific job for us each year, and I thank them for it. A Nebraska Furniture Mart located on 77 Acre, site on 72nd Street between Dodge and Pacific. We will again be having Berkshire Weekend pricing. We issued this special event at NFM eight years ago, and sales during the weekend grew from $5.3 million in 1997 to $25.1 million in 2004, up 45% from a year earlier. Every year has a set new record. In a Saturday last year, we had the largest single-day sales in FMS history, $6.1 million. To get the discount, you must make your purchase between Thursday, April 28th and Monday, May 2 
Between Thursday, April 28th, Mindy Me Too included and also present your meeting credential. The period special pricing will even apply to the products of several prestigious manufacturers that normally have ironclad rules against discounting, but that in the spirit of our shareholder weekend have made an exception for you. We appreciate your cooperation. NFM is open from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Saturday and 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Sunday. On Saturday, this year's from 5.30 to 8 p.m., we are having special fair for shareholders only. I'll be there eating barbecue and drinking Coke. Borosam's the largest jewel store in the country except for Tiffany's Manhattan store. We'll have two shareholder events. The first will be a cocktail reception from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. on Friday, April 29. The second, the main gala, will be from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Sunday, May 1. On Saturday, we'll be open until 6 p.m. We will have huge crowds at Borosam's throughout the weekend for your convenience. Their first shareholders' prices will be available from Monday, April 25 through Saturday, May 7 during that period. Just identify yourself as shareholders to your meeting, credential, or brokerage statement. Borosheim's operates in a gross margin that is fully 20 percentage points below that of its major rivals, even before the shareholders' discount. Last year, business over the weekend increased 73 percent from 2003, setting a record that will be tough to beat. Show me it can be done. In a tent outside Borosheim's practice, Wolf, twice U.S. champion, will take on all comers in groups of six blindfoldedly. Additionally, we will have Bob Hammond and, Short and Sharon Osbrick, two of the world's top bridge experts, available to play with our shareholders on Sunday afternoon. They plan to keep their eyes open, but Bob never sources his card, even when playing for a national championship. Gordon's My Favorite Steakhouse will again be open exclusively for British shareholders on Sunday, May 1, and will be serving from 4 p.m. To until 10 p.m. Please remember that to come to Gordon's that day, you must have reservation to make one call. 482-551-3733 on April 1, but not before if Sunday is sold out. Try Gorris on one of the other evenings you will be in town. Enhance your reputations at an Epicure by ordering as I do, rear T-bone with a double helping of hash, hash browns. We'll again have a special reception from 4 to 5.30 on Saturday afternoon for the shareholders who have come from outside of North America. Every year our meeting draws many people from around the globe, and Charlie and I have, want to be sure we personally greet those who have come so far. Last year we enjoyed meeting more than 400 of you, including at least 100 from Australia. Any shareholders Holders who comes from others in the U.S. or Canada will be given a special traditional instruction for attending this function. Charlie and I are lucky we have jobs that we love and are helped every day in the myriad of ways by talented and cheerful associates. No wonder we tap that to work, but nothing is more fun for us than getting together with our shareholder partners at Berkshire Animal Meeting. So join us on April 30th at the QS for Animal Woodstock for Capitalist. February 28, 2005, Warren E. Buffett, Chairman of the Board.